three inches. So 360 degrees for a 77 inch diameter hoop center line of the conduit would amount to four and a half degrees per three inch segment. And that four and a half degrees, we can look out along the, this pointer, which is the handle to the, to the conduit bender, and the tangent of this angle, which is four and a half degrees, is what determines how far we go, but we have to go a little bit further for spring back. When we get 20 of these bends done, 20 times 4.5 degrees is 90 degrees. We're going to have to produce 22 because the sides of the gar pull back in to adapt to the hull since the propeller is so large. It's a very simple procedure. It's even worthwhile doing on the guards that require half inch conduit. Remember this should be kept flat to the surface so that the bends are in a single plane. Half inch conduit can be bent up over your knee merely by drawing a pattern on the floor and bending the tubing until it aligns with the pattern. Obviously with a guard this big, we're going to have to make some final bends over larger spans for the final adjustment, but uh, the basic curvature of the guard is there, and it's repeatable. Time after time after time. Forming the hoops, the next step is to join the individual four assemblies that you've uh, bent up previously into two hoops by joining them at the center line at the top of the guard. You should put a little doubler, which would be a piece of conduit sliced in half, maybe about an inch to an inch and a half long, to make that joint extra strong and raise that joint. After you've assembled the four elements into two hoops, then the next thing is to place these uh, bars across the back of the guard. This is the rear hoop on the guard. Place these bars across the back of the guard and shape this assembly so that it's a little bit lopsided because remember the thrust line on Prospector is set over to the left by about an inch and a half. I would maybe make the guard lopsided by an inch and then set it to the side by another half inch to line the propeller up. After this assembly is set up, the next step is to braise these uh, members on the uh, cylindrical part of the guard. These members have been fish mouthed by merely running them on a flat sander, a belt sander. It can be done with a disc sander or a grinder. And uh, they are just held in place so they can be tacked thusly with this drywall square. I had previously leveled up this whole guard assembly, and uh, I can use uh, levels on the square or a regular carpenter's level to make sure that these are upright. I use a slightly reducing flame on the torch and tack, tack it in place. First thing you do is you preheat the joint, handing the torch basically at the heavier member because the lighter member or the edge of a member will heat up faster and get everything glowing to a little bit of a red color. 
and apply the braze material. This is a flux coated brazing rod, eighth inch, I believe. And uh, if the braze starts to burn, back off with the torch flame. If the braze is too cold, get the torch closer. A forward hoop, it obviously can't be bent perfectly to agree to the rear hoop when you try to match the two hoops up. So what you do is you set the lower hoop in the position you want the hoop to conform to, and then when you put the, uh, the forward hoop in place, you heat it and bend it to line up with the aft hoop so that uh, when you push it around, it doesn't bend the aft hoop out of the alignment that you've previously chosen. And it's done as follows. You look along it, and you pour the heat to it. You look along it, and to get a smooth bend, you can heat about an inch of this tubing with this particular torch. And you can heat it in spots and push it so you get a, still get an apparent smooth curve. Since the force is low, when you've heated it, it will not bend the F tube. and it's in position. Sometimes you may need a little force to get things to come around. It is and the Prospector Rescue Craft is coming right along. You can see that the Stand-up helm is underway. The two main combings for the cockpit are in place, and the two main bulkheads for the fan bay are in place. View of the hull. You'll notice the two main one-inch foam stringers have been glassed before they're put in place. Glassed on their sides, that is. The remaining glassing of these surfaces will be done when the craft is uh, finished and there's a view of the stand-up helm is and this is about the midpoint in our program with the King County Fire District 27 search and rescue sev 
This 8 foot by 16 foot SEV will be powered by a 62 horsepower Subaru engine. And this is the foam and fiberglass construction, about half completed. That's the stand up helm, as you can see to the right, and you can see the battery position and the fuel tank underneath an aft bench seat, an orange beacon light on the fan bay, and the rear extent of the machine. Adjustments may have to be made to the guard, and this is best done on the hull or on a pattern that I've drawn on the pavement for the rear of the uh, SAV. And in this case, I have a, the Spanish windlass to bend the guard, and I've strung plumb bobs from the upper part of the guard and also from the rudder points, and these plumb bobs will tell me how I'm moving the guard. And remember, when you use these plumb bobs, there's the spring back that you have to take account of. And this Spanish windlass is a way of generating extremely high forces. You crank it up past the point you want it to be bent to. In this case, I built the guard too symmetrically, and I have to make it a little bit lopsided to handle the thrust line offset in this machine, which is an inch to an inch and a half to the port side. That's the way you can bend these guards with excellent control. It's just use this Spanish windlass. An overall view of the guard showing the air drive fabrication in position and there's one of the fan ducts. One way to put the wire on is to put it on with plastic wire ties. Some people may prefer to braise it on. And the trick here is to avoid oxidizing the wire so you really have to pour the heat to the conduit part of the guard or you will oxidize the wire and later on it will probably break. You'll notice I'm holding the wire top against the structure with welding clamps. And you merely pour the heat to the conduit of the guard itself with the rod held in the background take a little heat and raise away. Looks like it might take forever but it's actually quite a fast process. This wire is about 16 gauge 1 by 2 mesh. This makes a lot better guard than the plastic wiring ties, which allow the guard wire to buzz against the frame. Somewhere under all of that neoprene spaghetti lies an engine. This particular engine happens to be the Subaru EA82. And what we're going to do is install the drive and carburetor controls for an engine on this engine. And this particular drive, all of the power will be taken off the flywheel end. And this particular drive is suitable for three and four cylinder inline engines also. This particular EA82 engine is part of the Japanese program where they ship engines from cars into the U.S. They're required apparently by law to remove them from cars at, at a very low mileage so a very good engine core may be obtained. The one caveat to this is that 
times these engines come in the country with broken up components on the outside of the engine as all they're interested in is the long block and so this has to be watched for. For instance, this has a broken valve and cam cover and uh, parts like that are hard to obtain. You literally have to go find another engine in, at a junkyard and take these parts off. Also, these engines come with all the accessories sometimes. Here's a power steering unit, pump, and here's an air conditioning unit. The alternator, which is something you would want, doesn't happen to be with this particular engine. And uh, the engine that you want to get is a manual transmission, carbureted engine. And here we have the manual transmission flywheel, and we have the carburetor. And this particular setup is the easiest to work with. The uh, ring gear for the starter motor seems to be built into the transmission components rather than on the flywheel in the, tra in the automatic transmission version of this particular engine. So one has to watch for this also. We're going to take this engine and strip all the parts off it that we really don't need. We obviously don't need a power steering pump and in some cases you might keep the air conditioning but uh, in this case we're not going to use it. Have no fear, all of this stuff can come off the engine and you still have a runnable engine. The air cleaner could be used, however there are accessory air cleaners that are much more compact and besides the uh, one that's on the car is all shot full of holes and connections that simply are not needed for this particular application. This is what the engine looks like after all the stuff that we took off the engine is off it whether the stuff is useless or stuff that we must use, like the flywheel here. We'll have a look at it. This particular engine is the EA82 Subaru, and the drive we will put on it is universal to uh, most of the small four-cylinder 1.8 liter engines. This is a plastic cover that is over the cam drives which are cog belts and this is the accessory drives you'll notice we've cut the accessories down to nothing but the water pump and this is the crankshaft you can see the carburetor is uh, unburied now and we've already started putting carburetor linkage on it you can see these mechanical devices have just been bolted directly to the existing carburetor without modifying the carburetor This is the throttle, and this is the choke mechanism, and we will later hook these up to control cables for operation in the craft. We'll turn the engine around. This particular EA82 engine has the distributor right out on the corner, and it's quite vulnerable to damage, and the flywheel is the first thing to pull, and here we have a set of eight unequally spaced bolts and to pull a flywheel all you have to do is back these bolts out of the flywheel place this bar across the uh, flywheel using the pressure plate holes and uh, just back the uh, bolts down and just pull the flywheel off it has a very short pilot is And we're going to take a look at the King County Fire District 27 Prospector Search and Rescue Sev. The Sev is pretty well along now. We've got the drive all set up. And what remains is primarily finish work. Normally, a builder of one of these Sevs should take the machine clear into flight at this state of finish. But we're going to go ahead and finish this machine up. three 
rotors drive off the rear of the engine. There's a huge beam across the back of the A-frame that supports the propeller. And belt tightening procedure is to first force the end of this 120 thousandths wall thickness, 3 inch by 1 inch rectangular beam and force the end down with that screw and tighten the two lift fan belts. The builder will find that uh, the engine weight alone is almost enough to tighten those belts and uh, they uh, should be brought up not as tight as the specifications say but something like the sound here would indicate. After the thrust belts are taken, after the lift belts are taken up, the thrust belt is taken up, and of course it's lower sound. Obviously, we can't install a propeller here, but this setup is ready to run. The exhaust system was put together by a ordinary muffler shop. This is the easiest way to do it, unless the person that's building the machine has skills involved to put a muffler system together but it can be done quite cheaply. This one cost about $125. The in and you can see the starter bolted to this aluminum plate which in turn is bolted to the engine itself. Other modifications on this engine are the carburetor. This lever setup on the carburetor handles both choke and throttle. I'll go around to the other side and take a closer look at that. You can see the choke and throttle lever coming out of the engine area and through the fan bay. That's the alternator drive back there and that is the air cleaner which is absolutely essential on a SEV. You must have a adequate air filter and no boat type rock filters or flame arresters as they describe them should be used here as this if the craft is driven in the dust this will cause the engine to be destroyed within as little as five minutes. These pre-molded ducts that Sevtech now sells and you can see the fan is attached with a ordinary bushing and a bolt is placed at right angles through the bushing and the fan hub is bolted to the head of the bushing makes a very simple setup and this is the lift fan drive pulley and we're looking directly down toward the engine pulleys there's a better look at the engine pulleys you'll notice there's a uh, what appears to be a machine part bolted directly to the flywheel that is what that piece in the Sevtech kit is for that appears to have uh, no function it's just a right circular cylinder it's a uh, sprocket hub for a conventional chain drive and I just shaft sticks into the pilot bearing bore in the flywheel and a piece of 5000 shim stock which can be the end of a feeler gauge is wrapped around the shaft to get a tight fit and you'll notice there are a couple of jack screws for this purpose on the end of these angles and there's also a bolt in here through the whole assembly to hold down this back jack screw because this part could ride up if there's a lot if belt tension is applied the belt again is in these bearing the the propeller shaft is again in the large bearings and obviously we can't install a propeller under this low roof a uh, tubular structure that picks up the bolts in the propeller and picks up the bolts in the Q1 bushing will carry the torque to the propeller the control panel for the King County Fire District 27 machine if there's a simple plastic windshield on it grip rails all the way around it to keep people from ripping the plastic windshield off and a normal boat throttle there's also a choke 
and a quite conventional steering wheel which is built only to turn about 35 degrees and there are also a whole lot of wires oh we're looking at the base of the helm we have two uh, foot pedals to actuate the flaps in the front of the machine to dump the air in the forward cushions and we have forward flotation compartments in this particular machine that are covered up with those uh, white uh, access hatches and you can see we have a whole lot of more wires it's surprising how many wires that you get in a system like this but this machine has all the lights and bells that the ordinary home builder probably would not need this machine has a uh, running lights it's got an external rotating beacon and uh, it's going to have uh, other gear installed on it this is a view looking aft toward the rear seat of the vehicle this craft has a stand-up helm and we didn't even specify a uh, helm seat there's the plastic windshield and we have a couple of uh, doors up here for uh, the one in the deck is for utility the one in the console is going to be so stuffed full of electrical cables and control cables it's sort of a, a dedicated uh, ship system area we have cabin lights inside the craft that's what you see below a grab handle and as you can see the wiring is not complete and we have our throttle and choke on the floor because we have yet to size our throttle and choke cable which should be done at the last moment and uh, should be done carefully as the cables are expensive and it's easy to get them too short the ship systems area aft and we can see what the fuel tank and battery installation look like The fuel tank is a conventional permanent plastic type with a fuel gauge and you can see the fuel filler tube, the fuel vent tube running through the combing at the side of the craft. You can see the little tray like device on the side of the craft prevents spillage into the craft itself while fueling and the fuel line is yet to be hooked up. The battery consists of a normal battery box that has been bolted to the floor, screwed to the floor. And you see a fuse and a battery shutoff switch, plus a bilge pump which is yet to be installed, and the drain hole in the rear. We're in the top of the fan bay, a access plate, and under that access plate are the radiator maintenance items you can see the lift fan in the background looking through the inside of the fan bay
Not too keen about the large mesh on the guard, but as you say, if you can't find the material, well, you can't I, find we the material. Let's take a closer look at it. This installation is running and is ready for skirt trim. You can see the distributor on the EA82 is quite widely spaced and it was decided to move the fan drives aft and take the entire power off of the engine and we have a bearing in the rear of the engine that supports the engine weight. It's essentially the same as mounting the engine by its crankshaft. You'll notice the starter has been sealed because uh, moisture tends to penetrate the starter and the starting solenoid. This has to be sealed. The exhaust system was made at a regular muffler shop it appears to be the least expensive way to make it. And you'll notice the radiation shield underneath the muffler assembly. The whole idea of this shield is to prevent the hot muffler from burning holes in the fiberglass. And there should be air circulation both above and below this particular shield. You'll notice the two aft flotation compartments have deck plates for access. And in this case, we're going to use a ordinary wet or dry vacuum cleaner to clean these compartments out whenever they need cleaning out as uh, drain plugs are hard to get to. Here's another view of the belt drives. The two belts taking off to the side are the 
fan belts and the propeller belt goes straight up to the big pulley that drives the propeller. The propeller torque is carried by a two and a quarter inch piece of exhaust tubing with 16th inch thick flanges brazed to each end and the flanges are drilled to take the Q1 bushing geometry and also the propeller geometry. You'll notice the shaft is also stepped down to one inch in diameter from its original one and a quarter inch as that's the prop hub assembly bore. This is the throttle assembly. It uses a Morse type or marine type 3 16 inch Bowden cable and this is the choke and these assemblies are bolted directly to the standard automotive carburetor and paper element air cleaner is also used. This is required in a sev, whereas in a boat they use sort of a flame suppressor which is more of a rock filter than a air filter. There are not too many problems on the water but the sev can get into dust and you simply must have this type of an air cleaner on a sev. The oil filler tube is turned around on the EA82 engine to get it out of the way. This is the alternator assembly, which is belted to the front of the engine, just as it would be in the automobile. And in the distance, you can see an oil pressure cinder unit, which is uh, a device that can be bought at an auto parts store and adapted to this engine. And the fans are attached to the fan shaft using a P1 bushing. A hole is drilled through the P1 bushing and the shaft and a 5 16 inch bolt inserted and the head of the P1 bushing is bolted to the fan. The fan must pilot on this shaft for accuracy. Tightening is done by forcing down this .125 wall thickness by one inch by three inch rectangular steel tubing using this jack screw and the belts will nearly be tensioned merely by the weight of the engine on the aft bearing. Propeller belt tightening is done after the fan belts are tightened using these jack screws. And also there should be a hold down screw on the forward end of this assembly. I'll show you another view of this assembly. Another view of the propeller shaft assembly. It's an inch and a quarter shaft going through two pillow block bearings. These pillow blocks are pressed steel so they can be brazed to a three inch length of exhaust pipe and they're placed on two one eighth by one and a half by one and a half steel angles which can be tipped up and down to move the whole assembly and tighten the belt using this jack screw and this jack screw and there has to be a hold down bolt also on this forward member. A view of the propeller shaft you can see the jack screws in the lower part of the picture and these pieces of angle iron are tipped up around a pivot on the left side of the craft to tighten the propeller belt. This is the fuel fill for this machine. You'll notice there's a scratch guard to prevent fuel from getting into the interior of the craft when fueling. And this is the fuel tank installation. This fuel tank is a permanent tank. You can see there's a uh, fuel fill line with two hose clamps on it. There's a fuel vent line. There's also a uh, sender for the fuel quantity gauge and you can see the fuel line in the uh, left of the tank. Battery installation, the battery is held securely unlike in a bolt 
the battery box should be screwed to the floor because a sev can experience jolts fore and aft more so than a boat. You'll notice a rotary switch which is used to turn the battery off. There's also a fuse on the high amperage circuits and the other object is a bilge pump which is yet to be installed.
The control console fails all the way around as a second rider may be standing by the helm while uh, the machine is underway. Uh, topmost is a tilt meter and you'll notice six switches on the left for various electrical functions such as running lights, cabin lights, there's a rotating beacon on this and also a bilge pump and you'll notice five instruments, the tachometer being the most important plus a quadrant tripe throttle and also a uh, choke handle which is that T-handle just beneath the switches and the helm itself is a steering wheel with a key start on the aft face of the helm. The bow vent flaps are opened by use of these pair of foot pedals which seems to be extremely workable in the stand-up helm case. we're working on the Explorer side extension assembly. You can see we have our ruler and 2x4s here referenced off the bottom of the craft and uh, we set up the cable which we made at the marine store do-it-yourself bench and we have it uh, 15 inches above the bottom of the craft or 30 inches above the running line and you can see when the, the craft is started skirt inflates, this snaps up to position and stops and of course when you shut it off it just gently comes down and you're trailering under 8 feet wide. Brian has completed the aluminum side bodies for his Explorer Sev.
polyethylene pad and the aluminum landing pads. And looking forward under the craft, you can see the four skids underneath the floor pan. Right now the machine is held up at about 25 inches, about 10 inches above its normal header height to make it a little easier to work. You ready? I'm ready. Here we're bending the partition skirt attachment piece. This is a curved piece that holds it to the floor panel. We're just making some final adjustments on it. Looks like it's bent a little too tight there and not enough over here. Well, I think we've got it. reasonable. It's time to build a windshield. Now either plastic or glass can be used to construct a windshield. However, since we're going to throw some spray and debris with an air cushion vehicle, particularly some others designs, even the Sevtec low spray designs throw enough spray that you're going to get 
an occasional droplet onto the windshield. If the area is real humid, you're going to get lots of droplets and they're not going to go away. And you're going to have to use a windshield wiper. So if you build a plastic windshield, be prepared to be very careful and have a bottle to wash it down with, a supply of water to wash it down with, and a soft cloth. And uh, also, when you're underway, you should either be seated high enough to just see over the edge of a plastic windshield, or be able to raise your head so you can see over the plastic windshield. But with a glass windshield, you can fully enclose the craft. And with the wiper, you can see where you're going. So it's a much more desirable situation. However, glass windshields can be expensive. And the only way to get one at reasonable cost is to build it yourself. The glass used in these windshields is, uh, in this case here, 3 16 inch thick safety plate. Uh, there's another type of glass called tempered glass that's more usually used in these windshields for boats and it's 5 seconds of an inch thick and uh, the, both of these types of glass can be purchased at any reasonably equipped glass supplier however in the case of the tempered glass they will usually ship it out and have it done as it's a specialty item and generally local glass shops can't handle it because of the glass cannot be cut and uh, it must be heat treated after it's cut. Now the moldings you use or the glazing that you use around the glass consists of uh, aluminum extrusions. There are extrusions for the posts that have the vertical extent of the windshield that stand up. There are extrusions for the base of the windshield that have an angle on the bottom so the windshield can be tripped, tipped relative to a deck. And there are extrusions for the top edge of the windshield that uh, allow a top to be secured to the windshield. These particular extrusions happen to be vinyl, which is rather unusual, but uh, they're normally aluminum extrusions. And uh, they seem to be going out of favor because the glass fiber boat industry has gone to uh, more of a high-tech type of windshield. They use curved glass and the windshields are usually purchased already made and they can be quite expensive. So the best bet is to build your own windscreen. The glass is held in the glazing or moldings or extrusions by a, uh, either a neoprene or vinyl gasket material and uh, these type of setup can uh, be used uh, on plastic also and frequently it's possible to build just the center section that you're going to be looking through out of glass, run a wiper on it and make the side panels out of plastic and these same type of extrusion system and, uh, and gasketing can be used. There's another solution to this problem of not being able to find these extrusions and that is to uh, buy an ordinary shower door kit. It has extrusions for glass. It also has this grommet or this uh, gasketing. And the only problem with it is you cannot gain the angles that you get with a windshield since all the shower door is is a flat pair of doors sliding in a couple of uh, aluminum extrusions. The way to get around this problem is disassemble the shower door, of course throw away the glass and buy new glass from a glass shop in the shape that you need and use the extrusions and these rubber grommets to frame the individual panels and to make them adapt to the strange angles that you have in a windshield you can get a 1 16th by 1 inch aluminum strip and with sheet metal screws you can attach that to the existing moldings since the moldings uh, are usually more than deep enough, the glass goes into the moldings only about halfway. Just use sheet metal screws and you can assemble quite a sophisticated looking windshield. The trick to putting the moldings on or the glazing on the glass is to heat the uh, 
vinyl gasket material up to around 160, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Get it real soft. You put it in place. And you put the particular pre-cut molding in its place over it. And you drive it into position. This provides a method for the individual windshield panels to be linked together. This other molding slides in place and can be either put at almost a 90 degree or spread out for the V section of this windscreen. It might be added, you have to leave little overhangs on the top portion of the uh, molding to overlap the uh, ends of these vertical elements. You can take as much as 50 gallons of water to balance out an Explorer for the skirt trim. A garbage can full of water is quite useful here. It also takes some weighted sticks to be forced under the edge of the skirt to keep
And our windshield is finally complete. This particular windshield is bedded into the foredeck with uh, 3M Marine 101 sealant. After building this windshield, it might be said that uh, I found it very difficult and it's quite understandable why marine industry people have these windshields built up by specialty shops and shipped to the individual boat manufacturers complete. I don't recommend this kind of construction unless the builder is capable of putting up with some degree of frustrations. One of the particular frustrations in this windscreen is sealing. There are so many modes for leakage that uh, this alone is a good reason to avoid this type of construction. The windshield might be great for a place like California, but here in the Pacific Northwest we go boating in the rain and this particular craft is going to go on some long range trips and as a result we have to get the windshield sealed up so that we can overnight in this vehicle. This is the Sevtec Surveyor, 15 feet long and it has a pair of 20 horsepower Vanguard engines for propulsion and lift. Each engine is separated in duty. One engine drives the lift fans, the other engine drives the thrust. You'll notice two throttles side by side. They can be actuated together so it can be driven as a single engine craft or they can be actuated independently so that uh, in cases such as tailwinds you can reduce the thrust and keep the lift up. A GPS and cell phone are installed as well as a VHS radio. So this craft is set up for long-range cruising in hopefully some kind of comfort. Canadian Hovercraft Club at Chilliwack, British Columbia. Here is a collection of Sevtex. Canadian Hovercraft event at Chilliwack, BC. Here is a mob of Sevtex.
Most boaters don't think of a top as being a necessity in a boat and a lot of hovercraft are pretty messy so they have to have some sort of a top or cover. This machine isn't particularly messy and it can be driven with uh, the sky as your overhead quite easily. However, it rains in the Pacific Northwest and if we expect to get off any cruising for maybe perhaps more than four days you will get rained on and you must have a top to be able to hunker down for the weather wait it out and then continue on now basically tops soft tops are usually made using a uh, fabric a very expensive fabric and they're sewn together what I'm going to try to do is glue a top together just as if I would be making a skirt now the start of making a top is to a similar a framework structure as I have here it usually consists of two bows it consists of hardware that attaches one bow to the second bow and it consists of hardware that attaches it to the sides of the hull and sometimes this particular piece of hardware is built to slide fore and aft. The reason for this is that the top has to be stowed and you may have to slide it to the rear of the craft to stow it. Another ingredient is a strap to hold the two bows at a certain spacing and in this case we have fixed the bow to the hull rather than having it slide because this whole setup will fall back and stow itself. Sure that your head is ahead of this forward bow and uh, then it's time to start figuring out the shape of the individual panels that are going to go into your top. These bows and the attendant hardware can be purchased at any marine store but they can also be easily built by the builder and even something as simple as uh, a conduit will do the same job with uh, parts fabricated by the builder or you can go to a marine store and purchase uh, bows like these which are aluminum tube with a nice fancy finish and anywhere from plastic through aluminum to stainless steel fittings to hold the top together it might not be a bad idea to go down to the local marina and look at tops and see how they're put together for a large The important joints that we're looking at now is just the joints over the bows. We'll make the rest of this top long so it gives us some tolerance as we lay it over the edge of the hull. Would we'll stop right here and this would be sort of a dodger type top. However, this is the Pacific Northwest so we're going to put the top to clear to the rear of the machine. paper top it wouldn't be too good in the rain but at least it defines the patterns that we need to make this top the important elements of this paper pattern are these joints between individual panels where they go over the bows these lower areas will be made long on the actual top and will be trimmed to fit when we install the top and yeah one other thing you'll probably notice a lack of windows and now might be a good time to decide as to just where these windows are going to go.
1998 Pacific Northwest Hover In. We have a lot of Sevtex here. This is a Spectra, non-flying at this show, a Dragonfly, Scat, Scat, Dragonfly, Scat, Scat, Dragonfly, Scat, a Starship, a Weber Star Cruiser, a UH-13T, Vanguard, 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 Prospector, Prospector, Surveyor, Prospector, explorer, explorer, explorer. A whole with SEVs and we'll look at a few trailers here. Here we have a trailer that the uh, machine is take, being taken off of and the entire bed of the trailer rolls aft and uh, drops the machine to the ground before it's, it's even turned on.
This is... <laughs> this is the electric winch. That's the heart of the whole system. You can see it's quite a complicated trailer. This is a fly-on, fly-off trailer, and the important aspect of this trailer is that there are rollers arranged along the side of the trailer to contact the outer portion of the skirt. So you just drive the machine off it, and you drive the machine on it. The problems with this type of trailer is you have a large flat deck area, and if it's made out of plywood, the plywood will deteriorate in a amount of matter of a few seasons. This trailer is lucky as it kept it's being kept indoors, but uh, when you can keep a trailer indoors, it doesn't matter. So a fly-on trailer, even for a large sev, is a pretty good option. You'll notice that the sides fold down so that the trailer is wider than eight feet because the skirt bulges out wider than eight feet and uh, you need this uh, extra width to uh, accommodate the skirt as it inflates. The machine, this is the machine that came off of that trailer. Remember the secret to this trailer is that pair of rollers or those sets of rollers on the edge of the trailer that guide the machine when it's either taken off or onto the trailer. See it? If you've got one of these little gadgets, you can just take an ordinary boat trailer and you can take it right out onto the sand, get a couple of buddies, and with a small craft like that, you can just lift it off the trailer. With a small machine, you can get away with horsing things around, and it makes launching and retrieving problems quite simple. This is a very simple little trailer. You can pick up at your local Fred Meyer. I don't think you can pick one of these up at Fred Meyer, however. of trailering. This builder uses a slip sheet and he lands the sev on the slip sheet and drags it up onto the trailer. This is the slip sheet and the trailer is nothing more than a little hot shop store Fred Meyer type cheapo trailer, very lightweight, and in this case it's a brake frame setup. I'm not sure whether the trailer came this way or it was modified by the builder. The has a Vanguard sev inside of it, and it has a sleeping compartment up front over the fifth wheel. And here's another form of fly-on trailer. With a smaller vehicle, you can pick up quite a steep hill as long as you got some help.
Here's another form of fly on trailers. You'll notice the sides that extend the width of the trailer fold out and are propped up on those little rods sticking out of the side of the trailer. When the trailer is on the road, these rods can be pushed into the frame so the trailer is not over width. And here is your slide-on support for the side extension to the trailer. Trailer. There are roller guide bars on each side of the trailer. The one on the left is folded up for travel position to get the trailer under an eight and a half foot wide width and the other one is folded down in loading and unloading position. This trailer has the rear end grouped down as close to the road as practical so that you've got a good start on a rampway up the trailer and no aft ramp is needed. And this trailer's deck is made in a unique way. It's made with an expanded metal lath and uh, the vinyl skirt material that's used in the skirts of vanguards is used on the deck so this particular deck should not deteriorate in the weather. Sev can run over rocks that are the size of a softball with occasional football sized rocks thrown in and if the Sev carries itself at a good height and if it has a compartmented skirt you could merely swallow the entire trailer as you have seen here. All I did was add four ordinary boat trailer rollers to the rear of the trailer and since I can roll the forward part of the machine onto the trailer while the aft part is still pressurized due to the partition skirt. This machine will go on this relatively high trailer with uh, very little difficulty. I can launch and retrieve dry or wet with a simple trailer and there's no need for a platform of any sort. When you're ready to go, then you bungee up the skirt. I have these little eye bolts eyelets here on the skirt. Then all I have to do is tie the crash down as I would a boat and I'm on my way. Putting windows in your vinyl top can be a little bit tricky. You should first cut out a cardboard form the shape of the window so that when you lay the vinyl fabric down you can shape your window properly and uh, use a soft vinyl clear vinyl 15 mils 20 mils thick 
for the window itself. Uh, this framework will easily get out of shape if you don't watch what's going on and you should use your template to line things up. This is where it gets out of shape. This piece of paper has to go down underneath the vinyl even on a uh, surface that you don't want to preserve because uh, you have to remove it before you paste the window down or you will get cement all over the clear spots of the window. So after putting it underneath, reshape and relocate the window so everything's squared away and then put weights on it so that things don't slide around. I try to get the glue right out to the edge in this case and when I pull the paper away just before gluing the joint together none of this glue will get on the window itself. It's nice to trade the side that the can is on because this stuff tends to drip everywhere. About a half an inch overlap should be sufficient for strength. And there you have your first joint. And here's the completed window for the sav. Very flexible. And it will wad up and take a certain amount of abuse when folding the top. And uh, not only will it keep you dry, if you have a liquid cooled sieve, it will provide insulation so you can heat the cabin. And the side curtain is done. It's held in place to the hull with a bungee that just goes around two small hooks that are bolted to the hull side. This type of setup should be built so you can prop it away from the hull so you can get air circulation when the machine is stored or the inside of the hull will get quite moldy. This engine is actually attached to the V-frame that supports the propeller and the belt load. And the engine is completely free of the hull itself and I have put two screw jacks, one here and one here, so that I can tension the belt and then tighten these four bolts after tensioning the belt. So it gives us a minimum problem setup for achieving belt tension. your way along a mud flat with a fogging up windshield, a rain and fog outside, you might think you're at sea level looking at all the water that's on this mud flat. 
However, there might be a surprise in store, like a five-foot drop-off. You can negotiate that five-foot drop-off with ease. However, the reason that drop-off is there is there's a channel and there's an abrupt five-foot rise on the other side. This can cause some problems. So it's a good idea when you do not know what the terrain is like that you're traveling on to take it easy on your speed and be cautious. This is the case in deep grass where you might be flying along and getting extra aggressive to punch through some grass and you might discover a little item like a boat motor that's out there rusting in the grass. So be cautious when you're running new terrain or it can get you in trouble. Fun. In late summer of 1998, Brian Phillips, myself, and John Carter, who shot most of the following 50 minutes of video, cruised from Anacortes, Washington, clear on up to Juneau, Alaska, with a few side trips thrown in. The Septec Explorer used on this cruise was built by Brian, and no support vessel of any kind was used on the trip. We start out on our cruise with Dave Crawford and his Vanguard. He would follow along with us to our first overnight near Nanaimo, next to the Vancouver Island. And the following morning, he would continue on with us up to Sandy Island, which is near Comox, which is about halfway up the east coast of Vancouver Island, to visit with Wolf Rottenberg and an older model, two propeller, Septec Explorer. We cruised and visited along the way on the inside passage and in the middle of the trip we visited very little because we simply ran out of people for, as there are not very many people for miles and miles and miles. Come on along and enjoy the trip. But they got my attention, and I don't do that, that no more. I mean, it's crazy. Very nice. Yeah. 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 yeah.
got to pull back a little bit. Yeah. That's what I do. Just pull well, the engine back. Be. Yeah. Well, you're just quiet, Brian. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I got a hot rod thing I got to go through in Wenatchee. All the family, the kids and everything, so I can't miss that. Okay. Take care. Take care. I've been griping to him about bringing too much food, and so far, we've actually gained food. <laughs> <laughs> Not just here, we, we seem to have obtained the entire meal with the individual that's with us that was heading back home, and he didn't know it yet. Hmm. Well, thank God you're not actually trying to do a caloric intake sort of scale on this thing, otherwise it wouldn't work. get that uh, action packer in here, John, once you get her packed up.
shit and that's here that you would say. Oh. I'm in trouble with the rocks here. I have to get up some inertia to be able to climb up. Oh, yeah? Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. And, uh, oh, or else we'd end up down and the tide would come in. We'd have to go back out again and do it again. Oh, well, I see. Uh, you yeah. tried it before. Oh, no, no. no. I mean, if we landed down low, the tide would just come in and we'd have to go back and land it again. But you can sit on the water still, too. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 It's a unique way, go, way of anchoring this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't carry an anchor, do you? Uh, unfortunately, there's an anchor there, but we hope it stays there. <laughs> <laughs> we do have yeah. that option if we, if we, if we screw up. Yes, because we'll there's not the always anchor. access like here, you know, going upward and not. It's all pretty rocky. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, if we can't see it, we ignore it. That's so right. what we're using for charts is a cruising guide. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to care about currents either. No. See, In, because, unless they're it, coupled it with the wind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, with the like wind. When you have a strong the current coming at you, you when don't you have a wind speed. wiping over the current. Yeah. It adds up to a oh, yeah. You start getting horse tail. Yeah. 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 But it's you don't sit under water at all. It's, it's well, you're about a third of a meter off the water. Oh, yeah. And the uh, vinyl part goes down and touches the water. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. encloses the air. What do you have on the bottom? What kind of material? All it's vinyl? It's it's fiberglass. Fiberglass. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Well, well this, this surface here is about a third of, uh, a, third of a meter off the ground. Mm -hmm. the so the only the, the vinyl ground. goes down. Right. And, uh, yeah. So what yeah. if you come rushing on the beach like this, and there's a rock and tears this uh, curtain here? Don't you lose your your up? Uh, no, lift? but you still have to get out and get under. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. See. yeah. I there's see. a glue yeah. that patches yeah. it quite yeah. readily. Yeah, incredible that thing. If I had landed it on this rock, for example, that would have been a bad thing. Yes. So, yes. you know, it, it, the surface has to be relatively nice. You, you don't want to land it on, no. you know, a pile of logs or, no. or especially rocks that are bedded into the ground. How much uh, speed do you get out of it? Uh, the top speed is 40 miles an hour. Wow. Typically, we're cruising at 25, 30 miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah. But the... Uh, yeah. With gasoline. The same idea. Yeah, yeah. It's metal plate, yeah? Yeah. Okay. I don't know how well it shows up on the radar. Yeah, I have to find that out. Yeah. Talk to somebody. Yeah. yeah. What a GPS you have along? We have the GPS yeah. and we have. Uh, some, some charts. We have a two ch charts. A world chart. <laughs> <laughs> It's supposed to be. No, it isn't. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. I can't take it back. Quick, quick. Been up here a long time, and if it was in, in our area, we might have to go to 
these are are, uh, are vehicle in private hands. If they're there, they're vehicles like they have to go exposed and spread. You can't stand up or anything. On trucks, is, is, is that's actually one of the names that's used uh, is truck tarp, uh, <laughs> or another one is sea tarp. But they, uh, I think they use it for covering loads on, on ships and barges. Truck tarp, you say? Yeah. Sea tarp. Huh. Great. How long did you get built? Uh, over three years and about 2,500 hours. Absolutely. I mean, there are lots of applications where this could be used to much better effect than jet boats and, and airboats, particularly. What do you mean? Um, well, to, uh, I've had lots of people describe to me their difficulties getting up the Yukon River and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, commonly are, are, you know, at, at a maximum for their, their range and fuel for where they want to go hunting trips and that sort of thing and they wind up sticking their jet boats on sandbars and so forth mm -hmm. and um, also spending a lot of time uh, navigating back and forth across these wide rivers to follow the channels and right. something like this you can just go straight you don't have to worry about what's under the water right. um, a lot of these rivers up here you, know, you get nothing but glacial till and you can't see right. the bottom either so uh, even if you're being careful you, uh, <laughs> you're going to run aground at some point how much do you burn per hour when you're at normal? 2.2 is what we're averaging gallons. How do you measure your 2.2 with a flow meter or your time, your hours between tanks? Uh, we, we know how we know how much we've uh, stuck in the tank to replace what we've used, and we also have an hour meter okay. that keeps track of how many hours the boat's been running. Okay, so your actual usage is probably a little higher because of the time it takes to start and warm up the engine and things like that. I when you're really running, it's probably more than 2.2. That's the way we look at it on our boat. Okay, well, I don't spend any time warming up. I just pretty much, uh, you yeah. know, maybe maybe two minutes oh, okay. at most. All right. So, uh, uh, I, I don't know how you want to figure it exactly, but yeah. it, it certainly is capable of burning more than 2.2 an hour at, at the certain throttle settings. But, right. But that's our average. Okay.
Okay, let's hit it again. You become a computer now, right? Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, uh, Where are you guys from? Anacortes, Washington. Oh, yeah. Just passing through. Did you come up on your dip over there? Yep. All right. Yeah, we uh, started out about a week ago, making our way to Juneau. All right. Yeah, on the inside passage, yeah, all the way. Yeah, it's uh, every bit of protected water we could find. Yeah, okay, here we go. <laughs> Take pictures from there, you can see them pretty good. But don't walk off the trail down too far. Okay. And that's all I had right now. If you guys wanted to head on up, um, unless you had some questions. Hi, Hi.
Nós temos ligado ali, mano. Vai ter a real. or out then. Now they have to do it all, so probably it steps up the number or at least a weight instead of bringing it. Yeah. Boat, uh... Yeah, is that enough room? Uh, we'll see when I get there. Okay, deflate one of those pontoons, maybe. That's mainly my rudders I worry about. <laughs> charts, you know, you just be flipping through them every two minutes. <laughs> As it is, you have to keep the atlas on your knee and keep an eye on it because otherwise you get lost. means that uh, an extended family had three generations lived here, and in the back is two shakes private quarters, or the head of the household, and uh, he and his immediate family resided there.
mean? Oh, yeah. But, uh, probably, uh, it's a very slow process in this location. But I want to sit here and look at it for a minute. Welcome to the Taku Glacier, the fourth longest glacier in southeast Alaska. No, the hovercraft's not stuck on the rocks. We just parked here for a perfect view. Okay, caveman number two emerging. Right. Ice man coming. The Alaskan pal. with Pat and catch this stuff? What's that? You, you and Pat catch this stuff out in the river? Uh, no, uh, we have to get it caught commercially. Oh, really? Yeah, to serve it to the public. <clears throat> but...
saying that there's a fish buying station up yeah. here or something. Yeah, it's up in Canada. Oh, okay. And, uh, yeah, I know the people real well. It's uh, Parisians. And actually, there's, I think there's some Indians up there that have uh, have a, a buying station, too. But uh, hmm. Parisians are up there, but I don't... How far up did you go? We went up, uh, I don't know, past maybe... The, past uh, the border? Past yeah. the border, yeah. Yeah, just a little bit. Okay, if you went on up past the border... <laughs> I saw a couple of fish camps there. Yeah, That's you know when you go past the border there, it's, I mean, to tell you the truth, you go past the border and uh, where the river goes to the right and then it looks like you, you could almost go up and through the left. Uh -huh. If you go up to the left and then it comes back over towards the river, that's where the fish buy and uh, deal is. Uh -huh. Yeah, we can decide whether we want to try to catch it or buy it. You know? So are you, are you a year-rounder up here? Or is nah, this just I just come up here to can up some salmon myself. July is the month that you're allowed to. stop and you're in deep water. Well, typically how deep? Oh, um, anywhere from 70 to two, 600 feet. Wow. We've, uh, we usually don't go much deeper than a couple hundred feet though. It's just too much trouble to try to drag, drag one of those big boys off the bottom. Do they fight a lot? Oh yeah. It's like dragging up a four by eight sheet of plywood. Holy cow. Yeah, it's just, you think that it's jabbed on the bottom and you're not ever going to get it back. And <laughs> just that's it. Well, typically, how big are they? Uh, light. The smallest ones we pick up are about 20 pounders, and they go. Uh, the record is uh, 680 pounds. Holy cow! Yeah, it's twice the size of a man. So you the club them when they come up. Yeah, if they're if they're small ones, you can club them. If they're if they're great big ones, you got to shoot them.
Are you with that one? Okay. You want to do walk? Uh, 